This is Pat's Probe on the Our Lads Football Network as the New England Patriots are playing New York Jets football, and it has to stop fast. Uh, Patriots lose to San Francisco, and Evan, we last week actually I, I mentioned how I thought that the loss to Denver was the worst loss that I had seen since pre Brady, and now statistically uh, we're getting uh, what what was it back to was it was a back to back losses like this for the first time since two thousand or something something similar. Yeah, first time since two thousand two that they've lost three straight. The 33 to six loss to San Francisco is the worst of the Belichick era, just from a point spread standpoint. At right. home, uh, they had obviously the 2014 game in Kansas City. You know that that's obviously always up there in terms of worst losses of the Belichick era uh, territory. I think the issue that we're seeing here, Greg, or, or feeling, I should say, is that we could chalk up things like, you know, uh, Kansas city in 2014, or maybe a couple, a few game losing streak. I think they lost four out of five at one point in 2018 before turning things around. We can say, okay, you know, they're in a rut, but they got Tom Brady to pull them out of the rut. Right. Yep. And now they don't have 12 anymore. So it feels, it feels way darker this time than it would in let's say 2018 or 2014 or something like that. Yeah. And, and look, it, there were some factors involved in it. It wasn't all Cam Newton, but he was a big part, no question. Uh, we can talk about, as you mentioned in your uh, 10 things post uh, yesterday, about the matchup being a bad matchup. But after what we saw in consecutive weeks, the the one constant is, is, is Newton. He's the one that's just not getting the job done at this point. So... What does Josh McDaniels need to do to get that fixed? Because it's strange that Cam showed some ability early on in the season when they were able to run the football a little bit. He was able to pass the ball a little bit, the Seattle game and so forth. What's going on here? Well, I think the first thing that Josh McDaniels needs to do is sit down. You know, there's a lot of kind of intricacies that we can discuss as well of what exactly it would look like on the field. But first and foremost, you got to sit down with Cam Newton and say, Cam, what are the 10, 15 concepts in our passing game, in our playbook that you feel comfortable running? Right. You know, let's throw out all the plays that you don't like, that you don't feel like are your, you know, fit you or you don't understand you know, the processing element of it or anything like that. It's just giving you trouble. And let's throw those plays out and let's focus on the 10 to 15 to 20, hopefully, concepts that he's comfortable with. And Almost like there. a young quarterback learning a right. new system. Right. And that's, I think, where they need to start with Cam now. And maybe they didn't need to start with him in week one at that point because they trusted him a little bit more as a veteran quarterback. But since he has got into this rut, you need to go back to square one and say, OK, what what of the playbook do you like? And the rest of it, we're just going to throw away. And if they have to run the same play three or four or five times in a game, then so be it. As long as it works, who, who really cares? So that's where I would start. The second place I would look is that this running game, the Patriots, and we talked about it to start the season and continue to, they need to be a dynamic rushing game. Yep. They can't afford to run for four and a half yards per carry in a pile of dust. You know, that, that that's not going to cut it in terms of what they can do uh, offensively through the air. It's just not good enough. So they need to be a dynamic running team. And I think what we're seeing with this running game is, yeah, they can still block. They can still double team at the point of attack with their offensive line and lead with the fullback or pull a guard and displace defenders. But teams are stacking the box. They're playing single high coverages more than any other team in the league is facing. And, and what's happening is, is that those types of runs, just the quarterback under center with the fullback in the backfield and you turn your back and you hand the ball off, they're not going to produce 20 plus yard runs like that unless they dress it up a little bit, unless they start to get creative with it a little mm -hmm. bit, like we saw Kyle Shanahan do, quite frankly, on the other side of the ball on Sunday. So currently the Patriots are 18th in the league in the utilization of pre-snap motion and shifts. Last year they were third in the league in rate of pre-snap motion and shifts. So they have decreased their usage of jet motion, pop passes, all that type of stuff that we saw out of San Francisco by 15% this year. I don't know if that's a Cam Newton thing versus a 
Tom Brady thing, but n- not getting more creative, not being a little bit more flexible, not being a little bit more, uh, you know, spicy with the motion and, and with the different misdirection and things like that is leading to them basically running their running backs into a brick wall and counting on the six or seven blockers that they have to just move 300 pound NFL defensive linemen. And I think what you see is that doing that consistently enough to score a lot of points is just out of the question. Yeah, and the the, the more film uh, the opposition has on what makes New England successful on offense, that's like you said, that's what the opposition's going to do. And and why not? T- until right. Cam Newton and this passing offense can open things up a little bit more for the running game, then you know, we the Patriots are going to see this every week. They should they should see it every week, and that's why it goes back to Cam. That's why Cam's and and Josh can also and and look, I don't know about the past plays that were called that Cam missed. I don't know if those were past plays that he's not comfortable with. I hope they were because they better not be past plays he's comfortable with because he's just right now he is erratic. Uh, his decision making isn't very good. Uh, the timing isn't very good and. That has to be fixed before anything else for Cam, even just the fundamentals of the way that he throws the football that we talked about last week. Yeah, I think the biggest thing that we're seeing with, there's a lot of things with Cam, but the biggest thing that we're seeing with him that troubles me is the processing speed. He he took 3.15 seconds on average to throw the ball last week. That's not the Patriots offense, right? The Patriots offense is hit the back foot and the ball comes out somewhere. That's what it's supposed to look like with Dutton. He's standing there in the pocket and he's holding the football a lot. And I think what's happening is, is that what ends up happening is he locks onto his first read and whether it's open or not, let's say it's not open in this case, when he gets to that second read, that those little quick routes that the Patriots like to run, the option routes, where there's really just kind of three different ways the receiver can go. He can sit or he can go in or he can go out based off the coverage. Once you stare down your first read, and let's say it's like a seam up the middle of the field, once you st- stare that down and you come back to the option route, well, the, the receiver's already done running the yeah. route. Right. So the the defender that's on that receiver in man coverage or in zone coverage or whatever, once he's done running the route and he's already looking back at the quarterback, now all of a sudden, if there was any separation, it's gone because it's too late to make that throw. So with Brady, what he was able to do is he was able to get so quick through the progression that he could read in his drop before he got to the top of his drop if his downfield first read was going to be open if he was going to be able to make the play all the way down the field up the seam or or whatever the case may be once he got to the top of his drop he was already making the decision to get off of that first read and onto one of the little option routes underneath the defense whether it was julian edelman in the slot or running back out of the backfield and unfortunately cam is just not processing it quickly enough to get to those points. And I think on top of that, the other thing that's really been uh, deflating this Patriots passing attack is the lack of, or or just lack of production, I guess, off of play action. So if you're a team that's going to run the football a ton and you're going to play a lot of the game in 21 personnel with the fullback in the backfield, you better be a darn good play action passing team because that's what, that's the best threat that you have, right? That, especially when you don't have great receivers, if you can displace defenders and create explosive plays with play action, then you're now you're talking a little bit more and you're a little bit more productive as an offense right now, the Patriots on under center play action, are 23rd in the NFL, averaging only 7.2 yards per attempt. For comparison, I believe it's the Seahawks maybe that are first, or uh, whoever is first is up in around 11 yards per attempt off of those those throws, right? So clearly a, a big difference there. It's actually the Texans right now, and they're over 12. I, I put it low. They're 12.4 yards per attempt. The Patriots are at 7.2. That is not And that doesn't even make any sense because Houston can't run the football. Right, exactly. Well, that's 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 what tells you about play action and the whole thing about you need to establish the run yeah. and stuff. That's, that's all a myth, right? What's really the reality of a play action fake is two things. One, you sell the run by your scheming of your blocking, right? If you pull a guard or you lead the fullback through the hole and make it look exactly like a running play. The second thing is that your formation. Okay, so if you're in 21 personnel, that's a run formation. So if you run the ball out of 21 personnel and then you show them the same exact blocking scheme out of 21 personnel and now it's play action and those linebackers should be flying up at the line of scrimmage 
But unfortunately, they're not right now for New England because Cam is not really great at selling those under center play action fakes because it's not really something that he's ever really had to do in his whole football career. I mean, how many times do you think Cam Newton ran under center play action at Auburn? Zero, probably. So that that's really the biggest thing is that that needs to be a big part of the Patriots offense. It's been a huge part in the past with Tom Brady. Last year, they were up at 9.1 yards per attempt, so almost two full yards more than where they're at right now. And it's not it's non-existent for the Patriots at this point. So they don't have any talent on the outside to just kind of roll five eligible out there and win one-on-one matchups. They can't displace guys with play action and win that way. So where do you go if you're the Patriots right now through the air? Have you had the time yet to look at the stats from the first few weeks till, till these last couple of weeks and try to find out what's different? Is it, is it just cam is, 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 and now look, I understand that the Denver game, Patriots had like a disaster, disastrous situation on the offensive line. But Correct. in the San Francisco game, everybody was back. So yeah. there's so 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 there are a little end. I get it too. Yes, we can talk about bad matchup for the defense against San Francisco. So there's that. But let's just is there a way to look back at those first few weeks into the last couple of weeks and say, here's the difference. I would say the biggest difference is what we're seeing on the offensive line. You know, not to make excuses for the Patriots, but the injuries there have basically eliminated. First two weeks of the season, they ran that big seven offensive line package a bunch, especially in short yardage and goal line situations. And they were just, it didn't matter how many players the defense, the defense put in the box because they were just dominating, okay. right? They were just overpowering teams out of that package. Furthermore, in week one, Cam ran the ball, what, 14, Correct. 15 times, something yes. like that? The option runs and the quarterback design runs were were just taking the league by storm at yeah. that point. What ended up happening was, especially with the option style runs, not the seven zero line package went away because of the injuries. Right, they don't have the depth anymore on the offensive line to get into that seven zero line package anymore. What happened with the option runs? is that they were pretty basic option style plays zone read, mostly power read where the defenses in the league are smart. And if you keep on running the same thing week in and week out, they start to catch up to you. And now defense is what they're doing. Not so much the Niners. I thought the Patriots, if the score wasn't so lopsided, they might've leaned on the option runs a little bit more because the Niners didn't have a ton of success stopping them this week or in past weeks. But for the most part, Denver, especially they are now scheming and game planning for the option style football. So when they run a power read, they're no longer putting defenders in conflict. They're no longer putting the defense on on their back heels because they're ready for it. And they have a game plan on how to attack it, a scrape exchange or whatever the case may be that they're using in terms of a scheme. So that that's what we're seeing is that okay. that bully ball offense that they started the season with is now no longer effective because of several different reasons. So now it's sort of all falling on Cam Newton as a drop back passer, which has never really been his style of play anyway. And, and look, I mean, at this point of the season, after the way the team began rushing, rushing the football and having the success that they had, you would have thought that Cam would have been able to begin getting a little bit more acclimated with this offense, with the passing game, with his receivers. So then they can be ba- a little bit more balanced and they can keep the defense honest. That's just not happening because Cam's not playing well. Right. And, you know, the second thing is, too, with this is that if you're going to be a bully ball style offense and you're going to run a ball 40 times, then you better be either close or ahead on the scoreboard. Absolutely. Right? You get down by a couple of touchdowns the bully ball thing and the sad part about it was is that the Patriots in the third quarter against the Niners actually went back to their running game down by a couple of touchdowns because they were so terrible throwing the football that they were actually gaining more yards running the ball than throwing it anyways so they went back to the running game that's the biggest thing is that if you're going to get into that bully ball style offense and the game has to go the way that it went against Miami which is play from in front win a game 21 to 11 or whatever it was and get out of there with a low scoring offense with a really good defense. And and so far, you know, sometimes the defense isn't holding up their side of that coin and and other times the defense is on the other side of the ball. You know, the opponent are scheming up ways to stop the Patriots rushing attack and they don't respect the guys on the outside. So they're loading the box and they're playing tons of single high structures. And it's just, 
they're not talented enough at the skill positions to be able to just create in a phone booth like that. And and other teams have those types of skill players and the Patriots don't. So they need to find a way to manipulate defenders, move guys out of passing lanes, move guys off their spots and, and be able to attack defenses with misdirection and deception and things like that. And it's not working that way right now. for them. All right, The whole Brady thing, uh, uh, this is just going to go on and on until Brady retires, basically. So yeah. um, I, I honestly... Look, Cam played so poorly that there's no question that Tom would have played better than Cam the last couple of weeks. Um, I don't see how, though, sure, I think maybe the, the, the Patriots could very well have won the last couple of weeks if Tom Brady was the quarterback, because that's how bad Cam played. Um, maybe he would have had to have been more in a high-scoring game, though, on Sunday, because the Patriots' defense just didn't look good against San Francisco. You talked about the matchup problems. Maybe they win one, one of the two, realistically. Um, but this, I don't know, imagination that if Tom was with the Patriots, that everything would be gravy, and the Patriots would be the Patriots, and they'd be in first place right now, and the Bills would be trailing them. I, don't, I just don't, I don't believe in that, because I think that's not, not just Brady. There's so much defensive talent that's gone from this team talked about the injuries at the offensive line and I, I i and i believe and i think we've talked about this that look brady kind of he didn't feel comfortable what was happening with his offense and he goes to a team in tampa bay where everything is just lined out on a red carpet for him with the talent he has at receiver and the offensive mind of arians and he, he just had to go there and keep playing good ball and and if he played good ball which he's played he knew that he'd be able to, and he's got a good defense too. He know he knew what would be going on right now in Tampa Bay, which is what is happening as he's turned that team. He's been a part of that team, uh, uh, becoming maybe the best team in the NFC and maybe in the, in the NFL by the end of the season. But back to the Patriots, I don't see it being a dramatic difference if Tom's there. I just think whatever the reason that Tom actually left made sense and you just got to live with it and move on. But it's just not going to be the case until, like I said, until Tom retires. No, I don't think it has anything to do with whether it was Tom or not Tom. You know, I think the biggest thing that we're seeing is what I mentioned is that they're kind of trying to fit a round hole into a square peg right now with Cam Newton in this drop back passing game. Are you surprised really by that, that they don't have another answer already? Yeah, and and that's I think troubling. And some of it again is you know when you get down in a game like that, you got to throw your way back into it. And and at some point in time, most NFL games come down to which team can execute some semblance of a drop back passing game better than the other. That that's that's most matchups. That's what it ultimately comes down to. If you look at the last two Super Bowls, that that's exactly what happened. You know, the Chiefs and the Patriots executed their stuff in terms of drop back passing better than the Niners and the Rams did. And that's why the Patriots and the Chiefs won those Super Bowls. So that's ultimately what comes down to in the NFL at the end of the day. And, and it's all on cam to kind of be able to get up to speed there. But in terms of Brady, and sort of being better in this offense or worse. I, I think that the overall kind of inability to add skill talent, yeah. whether it's developing it in-house or drafting it properly, you know, I think it's two different things and they all relate, right? I think it's, I think it's three different things, really. It's talent evaluation from a front office perspective in the draft and being able to identify the best playmakers to draft in that way secondly it's then developing that talent once they get to foxborough the coaching that they're getting on their technique and their route running and things like that and then thirdly i think it's utilization of that talent that they're drafting you know why to me it's it comes back to like and Nikhil harry is such a perfect example why is Nikhil harry running you know a timing route on the outside that that's never been his game right you know you run to eight yards and break and i'll hit you when you get yeah. there that, that's been who he is right he's a run to space win jump balls create with the ball in his mm -hmm. hands that's the type of receiver that he is and that's not how he's being used because that's not the patriots offense so again round hole square peg with the tight ends they just don't feel comfortable with kind of letting them go right and, and letting them play we saw Dalton Keene a little bit. We've seen Devin Asiasi a little bit. Keene made his debut against the Niners, and yet they still don't seem too interested in getting those guys heavily involved in the scheming or the game plan. And that, to me, is is 
also troublesome because it either means that they're not good enough to be involved or it means that the Patriots are putting so much on these guys' plates that they're not ready mentally to handle What was the all. targets so, for Keen this week? He had one target. One target. And one, he, had, he had one target and one catch, and that's the first catch any rookie tight end has had for the Patriots this year. So either Ossie okay. Ossie or Keen who are two guys they drafted in the third round in April, two guys they traded up for to draft in the third round in April, and we're in week seven, and it's the first time either one of them has registered a catch in a game. What about, is I mean, the, you think you think the Patriots would be interested that? in David Njoku? I, I don't even know if David Njoku fixes it, because David Njoku is going to have to come in here. He's going to have to take the same playbook and the same install that those two guys have. He's going to have to learn the whole thing. We won't see David Njoku on the field if he goes straight to the Patriots until week 10. You know what yeah, I mean? Sure. Like that, that, That's just how it, it sort of work, it seemingly works here. So I think that's the frustrating part from, as a Patriot fan, is that what I would love to see is them utilize the talent that or the players that whether they're talented or not utilize them in ways that are useful for them you know that are ways that they can win Dalton Keene is a receiver is a is a blocking tight end slash h back slash motion guy lead blocker you go watch him at Virginia Tech and he's doing all sorts of things behind the line of scrimmage whether it's in the running game catching screen passes catching flares into the into the flats catching misdirection throws in the backside of the formation you know all those types of things and then on Sunday he's out there running routes and, and trying to get up the field and doing things that he's just hasn't done a whole lot. And I, I, I just I question the usage of those players. I question the development of those players. Yep. We talked and about that it, last week. The house of cards, you know, if you don't do any of those things right, then this is what you get. That's right. Because look, I mean, w- would you agree with me that if the skill position players for Tampa Bay were switched to New England, that Tom Brady would still be there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I think that's that's pretty much the only reason why he left, right? It was was because of the skill talent yeah. and because it just sort of their inability to develop it. And I think Brady himself got a lot of flack for that over the years, that he didn't want to let younger players in the circle of trust or he didn't want to go out there and put in the extra work with the Nikhil Harry and work on his route running and work on his timing with a younger player. And he didn't want he wasn't interested in doing any of that. And I, I think that there's some truth to that. But at the same time, I mean, like I said, it's three pronged. It's talent yeah. evaluation from the front office. It's developing the talent and then it's using the talent properly. And right now, all three of those things, I think, are helter skelter. All right. Uh, let's take a look at a few other uh, details. I'll, uh, well, I, let's, let's talk about some of these new players on defense. All right. What do we know about this Thurman kid? Because I don't even I don't even see him on the Patriots. I don't even have he's him on the, on the roster. Where was he on the practice squad? Yeah. So he got elevated. He's been elevated a couple of times as a COVID replacement. Him and from Bauer, practice- right? Yeah. Him and Bauer were last week. Thurman, I think this might be his third or fourth time up on the active roster for game day. Uh, he's in, you know, he's never really done anything to re- flash all that much until last week you know he's kind of been that traditional patriots a gap player just eating up blockers and taking on guys at the line of scrimmage and holding up to make sure that everybody else can do their jobs and that sort of player and then all of a sudden you know now he's you know in that game against the niners he shoots up the field and makes a really nice play behind the line of scrimmage and i think the sad part about it is if you're a patriot fan is according to pro football focus the highest graded players on the defensive side of the ball in the 49ers were uh, bauer and thurman the two guys that they called up in the practice <laughs> wow. the day of the okay. game okay that, that's not a day before the game i should and, say and that's, that's, and that's a, just a matchup deal you think they're back to the practice squad yeah, so they're going to keep going up and down. Okay. You know, I think there's other players that they have on the roster that they would be fear they would worry about cutting and getting scooped up by another team. So those guys have gone back and forth. Uh, not Bauer; he's only been up once, but Thurman's been back and forth a couple of times, and nobody's going to claim him on waivers or anything like that or poach him off the Patriots practice squad. So I think that they feel comfortable with continuing to do that. All right, and why no Duggar? Well, Duggar was hurt. He, he he was inactive for the game with an ankle injury. I, I actually think that that was a really big deal at the end of the day, which is, again, 
a rookie playing his seventh great game who is a kind of a raw prospect and, and has a ways to go being a big deal is is kind of tells you where they're sure. at um, talent wise on the roster but i think having a guy like duggar who can bang in the box who can play linebacker as a safety and then can also run sideline to sideline really really well and tackle in the open field against all that motion and the jet plays and the throws behind the line of scrimmage that san francisco ran i think a player like duggar would have made a huge difference to get guys like Anthony Jennings and Jawan Bentley out of those situations a little bit more and, and allow them to get a little bit more speed on the field while still being physical. Yeah, speaking of Bentley, it was interesting because uh, you had mentioned at, at one point uh, a few weeks ago uh, Bentley's inconsistency, uh, and he goes and has a tremendous game against Denver, uh, maybe his best game of the season. And then his first opportunity to make a play last week he lets Jimmy Garoppolo bounce off of him to pick up the first down on third down, which, by the way, eventually leads to San Francisco's first touchdown. Uh, so, and, and he wasn't all over the field like he was against Denver. Those are some of the things uh, that I guess you're just going to get from a player like Bentley. You know, he, he's, he's a decent player. He's going to have his ups and his downs, but he's not high tower. You know, and again, it just shows you, just like we mentioned, when you're having to rely on Duggar, you know, there are other guys that, they do have to rely on to be more consistent. And, uh, and then also at linebacker, you have Chase Winovich who can make the dazzling play because he's having a good season as an edge rusher compared to anybody else on the Patriots. But when it comes to stopping the run, he's just getting run over. Yeah. You know, I think the the, it's tough because with Bentley, for whatever reason, you know, he's really only good at coming towards the line of scrimmage, whether it's against the run or it's as a blitzer or, or a guy that's just going to, you know, disrupt things in the trenches. That That's all he can really do is come forward. And unfortunately for the Patriots or fortunately for their opponents, all the offensive coordinators in the league know it. And a guy like Kyle Shanahan, a guy like Pat Shermer the week before who know what they're doing and understand how to design offense and how to game plan offense, they have put 51 in an absolute blender every single week, right? Get 51 in space, get him moving laterally, make him cover sideline to sideline, make him stop the runs on the outside on the perimeter, and just don't run it right at him, right? Do everything that you you can to run it away from him and make him be an athlete and he just can't he's just not an nfl athlete in that regard so they have really kyle shanahan he just put 51 in an absolute conflict all day long and it was run pass conflict it was outside run inside run conflict it was play action dropping this you know spots and zone drops in the middle of the field to take away slants and crossers and things like that and benley was just lost the entire game it was, it was a disaster of a game for him and i think when i look at this patriots defense I'm starting to give up. You know, they lost Brandon Copeland to season-ending injury, it sounds like anyways, but I'm starting to give up on the off-ball linebacker position for the Patriots. If it were me at this point, I would just put guys like Adrian Phillips and when Kyle Duggar comes back from injury, Kyle Duggar off the ball, line five guys up on the line of scrimmage, six guys up on the line of scrimmage, whatever you want to do there to stop the run and rush the passer and just cover with as many defensive backs as you can because these Patriot linebackers, whether it's Jennings or Ben, or Copeland when he was healthy are getting exposed time and time again and it's just it's it's frustrating to watch them because they're they're being put in a position that it's impossible based off their skill set for them to succeed and, and I just don't know how you get away from that other than to just take them off the field entirely right, well, what about uh, two of the top picks uh Chris Jennings received just about as much if not more playing time than any other game this year and what's the latest on Uche? Yeah, Uche is still out of practice, but not active to the uh, to the roster. So he's still technically in that injured reserve window where they have three weeks to activate him to the roster. In terms of Jennings, you know, it's interesting because in college he was mostly an on the line of scrimmage player, yes. end of the line scrimmage yes. player, rushing the passer, setting the edge, doing things like that. The Patriots are so thin at off-ball linebacker that they've moved him to inside linebacker a little bit, having him play off the line, and it hasn't been as good. The dividends haven't been as good. You know, there's one play early on in the game where they ran jet motion to his side, and he had the flat, and he was over the slot, and it was George Kittle. 
And instead of jamming Kittle at the line and then playing the flat, he just let Kittle go right by him. And Jimmy Garoppolo threw a play action slant to Kittle for a nice gain. And you look at those types of plays and you just say, okay, well, if you just held up Kittle for an extra second at the line of scrimmage and the the linebacker dropping into the slant window might have gotten there a little bit faster and maybe that's not a play that happens the same way or it doesn't go for as many yards. And, And there's just mental errors right now with Jennings and you see that he is an athletic guy, and, and he is a guy that, that can drop into coverage a little bit. But because he's thinking so much and, and the game is a little bit fast yes, for him yeah. at the moment, he's just make, he's playing a lot slower, I think, than what he actually is capable of playing. Yeah, you, and you said it. it it's just not as – he's out of position, especially this stage of his career. He needs to yeah. just be – and I know it – look, I'm not going to tell Belichick what to do, but the fact is, is this shows you he's desperate. And he's playing yeah. players out of position. He knows they shouldn't be in this position. He, he, I'm sure he'd rather have them sit, go after the quarterback, you know, penetrate, that kind of thing. Like you said, line of scrimmage. Uh, but getting some of these guys like Bentley and Jennings to have to cover and things of that nature, it's just not working out. And it shows you how uh, they're getting beat up by this type of an offense, which then poses the question, is there another offense on the Patriots' schedule that – can hurt them this way well the one that you immediately kind of think about is baltimore right you know they can certainly get into some similar looks i think you know the patriots we've talked about it a bunch the patriots are really built to play kansas city you know they're built to play a team that that you need to shut down their receivers and you need to have a bunch of different types of defensive backs to go up against those receivers and you're not too concerned necessarily about the running game so what happened against the niners was you know Early on in the game, they played base defense for the first time all season, where they had a traditional 4-3 look, basically, or a 3-4 look, and the Niners were able to hit the edges, right? They were able to get outside of those big guys and get the ball out on the perimeter and turn the corner, and you got Jawan Bentley or John Simon or Anthony Jennings or Brandon Copeland out there in space against Debo Samuel, and, and you all can guess how that went, right? So then the sort of adjustment that Belichick made to that was to put guys like Adrian Phillips and Jonathan Jones closer to the line of scrimmage to get faster to handle the motion. And then the Niners just ran it right at those guys and, and just beat them up at the point of attack and were able to outmuscle them because they're smaller and they're defensive backs. So the Patriots are sort of in a conundrum here where they don't have the talent or the athleticism at linebacker to play base defense, but they don't have the power or the strength to hold up against the run out of their dime looks. So If you're not going up against a team like a Kansas City who's really predicated on their passing attack, what do you do against a team like a Baltimore, like a team against the Niners, if they ever play Tennessee at some point? You know, what do you do against those types of teams? The Patriots right now defensively are the last thing that Bill Belichick ever wants to be, and that is predictable. They are not flexible. They cannot game plan and week to week morph into the defense that they need to be like Belichick would want because they just don't have the talent at the second level of the defense at the linebacker position to be able to be a base defense or to be able to be more of a lighter sub package defense. And, And that's what we're seeing in the Niners. We're just the perfect team with Juszczyk and Kittle and their running game and their motions and all the things that they can do from that standpoint was just a horrible matchup for the for the real weakness of this Patriots defense, which is they can only play one way. They can only play in dime defense with extra DBs on the field and flood the field with speed and coverage ability. If you're a team that can run the football, then you have a trump card over New England right you now. Know, it's, it's interesting because when I look at uh, some of the key plays early in the game, because the game was really over at half, time when i look at the key plays it's almost like the way i've had to look at jet games this year what i mean by that is is that i I, because you know all all the jet fans want to talk about is is how bad the team is and they're no good and they want to get rid of gays and that's all they care about you know they, they don't really see when the game even though the score might be a blowout like new england was at halftime if you make a play here and you make a play there and your quarterback does well It's not as bad as the score would indicate. And that's basically what happened here because we mentioned Bentley's missed tackle on Jimmy Garoppolo. He makes the tackle. They punt. They don't score a touchdown. It's as simple as that. Uh, McCourty gets the interception. Then Winovich gets the 15-yard penalty. That moves him out of uh, field goal range right off the bat, even though, well, bottom line is, then then they come back with uh, Newton uh, missing, again, a wide-open bird. 
I mean, how many times have we said that over the last couple of weeks? They have to settle for a field goal. And then a Newton interception leads to a San Francisco touchdown. So it's like the first couple of touchdowns for San Francisco could have easily been negated by don't turn the ball over and make a tackle. Yeah, I mean, they missed 11 tackles in this game. Uh, the Niners gained almost four yards per rush after contact. They gained something like 189 yards after the catch through the air. Jimmy Garoppolo had the lowest average depth of target of any quarterback in the league and the highest yards per attempt in week seven because they threw everything short and they ran with it. And the Patriots were just unable to bring those guys down. And 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 that's that to me is also troublesome because the Patriots are usually one of the better tackling teams in the league and have yep. been all year. So maybe it's not troublesome because they should be able to fix that. But I think ultimately what it comes down to is the Niners have guys like Debo and Brandon Ayuk and George Kittle and all these playmakers who are big and explosive, right? They're not just fast guys like a Tyree Kill or a Mecole Hardman. They're also guys that can run through contact and, and be able to punish you with contact balance and, and, you know, just create those extra three or four yards and push the pile or land forward or whatever the case may be. So the, the Niners are a great scheme. They have a great coach in Kyle Shanahan, and they took the Patriots to the to school, frankly, uh, on Sunday from a coaching standpoint and a talent and execution standpoint. And I think each and every single week, the Patriots play a game, even against Denver, against certainly against the Niners, Kansas City is duh. You see the discrepancy in skill talent, right? On one side of the ball, the Patriots go to the huddle, but Demir Bird and Jacoby Myers yeah. and Damian Harris and Ryan Izzo yeah. and uh, you know, whoever. And then on the other side of the ball, they got Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, George Kittle, Kyle Juszczyk. You know, it's just such a difference, Absolutely. right? It's just a stark difference in talent there. And, and that speaks to, you know, more about talent evaluation and front office and inquiring sure. players. But it, it's it's a whole systematic issue right now with the Patriots all entire uh, all the way up and down the roster. And, and to go back to your point about Brady, I, I agree that I, I don't know if this would be that much cleaner with Brady under center. Now, granted, they probably still win 9, 10, 11 games because that's who they were with Brady. But I'm not sure that that masks, even Brady masks all of the issues that they had talent-wise on the roster. Uh, and and to, to what Slater said about attitude and effort, what do you think about that? Yeah, you know, I, I think anytime you get blown out like that, it's embarrassing, right? And And that's definitely not up to the Patriots' standard. And, and I, I, I think that that's certainly where they're trying to start internally is by setting a bar, right? And saying, you know, just because Brady is not here, just because we don't have Gronk anymore, we're still the Patriots and the standard is still win every single week and compete for Super Bowls. And they got to have to set that bar even higher now, I think, because the margin for error is, is definitely shrinking. Uh, they're running out of excuses. Uh, they're running out of time. You know, if they don't beat Buffalo this week, then they're probably not going to win the division well, What do you think year. about the matchup? Well, I think that the, you know, in, in most years I'd say, well, at least they're familiar with them, but Newton's obviously not super familiar. Although I guess going up against McDermott and that that's sort of the defense he went up against a lot in practice in Carolina. So maybe, maybe there's some elements of that. I think the nice thing about this matchup is that the Patriots can probably make Josh Allen look like the old Josh Allen for four quarters uh, defensively because they can play against Buffalo the way that they want to play, sure. right? They, they can play in dime. They, they're not going to be too concerned. I don't think about the Bills running for 200 yards against them like San Francisco did. So they're able to do a little bit more like that. And I think that they are they match up much better against Buffalo's offense. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that we've seen Josh Allen have issues with are things like post-snap safety rotations, right? The defense shows you pre-snap that it's cover two, then they rotate into single high. Now what do you do, right? And, and Josh Allen has had those problems in the past. Belichick always spins the dial against him and makes him react after the snap to whatever they're doing defensively and find his answers. And, and sometimes that gives him pause or you know, kind of gets them into making mistakes and things like that. And I think Tennessee and some of the other teams that have had success against Buffalo have signed, sort of gone with that blueprint of eliminating big plays over the top to Diggs and John Brown, certainly, by trying to confuse Josh Allen as much as possible and not let him get comfortable back there. All right. So uh, Bills are, I think, about a four-point favorite. Uh, you think that's about right, too? Or, I mean, the way the Patriots are playing? I 
I thought it was a little bit low, but the one thing when you look at Buffalo is that they're five and two, but their point differential is in the negative, right? They've actually been outscored this season. So I'm not sure how much that five and two record really means. Uh, ultimately, I think that this is a game that Buffalo should be favored in, uh, given how the Patriots offense has looked. But this is sort of a Patriots offense that has struggled at times versus a Buffalo defense that has struggled at times. And the defense on Buffalo's side was supposed to be their strength. And now it's, they've kind of been more off heavy this year so I think both teams are kind of uh, sort of searching for answers on one side of the ball so I'm really kind of interested to see uh, how they come out of it I think last week against the Jets I don't even know if I'll watch that Jet game quite frankly for the Bills because I don't know how much it really matters uh, sure. going in this I would say that mostly the ones that matter are probably uh, the ones that Belichick's going to watch a ton I'm sure is the one against Tennessee well look uh as you said, not only does it matter for the Patriots with the division, but as tough as the AFC is, you could also say that the chances are of them getting into the postseason is going to go down big time if they lose this football game because Sir. Cleveland, they've put themselves in a really good position for one of those spots. That would be three teams in the North. And if you, and if you take two teams in the North as a wild card, now you're, you're down to one team and you got the Colts who are playing pretty well. Uh, your, your, your window is closing pretty fast. So yeah, yeah, I get the feeling that if the Patriots don't win this game, not only does the Eastern division uh, crown uh, chances go down the window, but potentially the playoffs as well. Yeah, I think that that's definitely true. And you also are going to kind of get into territory of you sort of selling at the deadline at that point, I think, as well. And do you start to entertain, you know, trading a Stefan Gilmore or trading Joe Tooney and sort of doing that piece of it also? Oh, are there free and, agents that may not be back after this year? Yeah, so Tooney's on the franchise tag right now, and he's a guy that certainly could get traded before the deadline. Gilmore has been getting, they've been shopping Gilmore since the offseason. They're, both sides, Gilmore's side and the Patriots are sort of heading for a divorce because the Patriots are not going to give him another contract, at least not at the number that he wants it at. It's, I think it's a similar situation, you know, different career arc, obviously, in New England, but similar situation to Darrell Revis after the 2014 season where Revis wanted one last big payday and it wasn't going to come from Bill Belichick. So that's where the situation with Gilmore. He's not a free agent next year. He's a free agent the year after that. So he's got one more year on his deal. Uh, I, I think the Patriots are... They, I know that they've been shopping Gilmore since the offseason. They've been sort of dangling him out there, waiting for a real kind of godfather type offer from him, and they haven't gotten it yet. What, what are so, they looking for? I would say they're probably looking for a top 50 pick, you know, something in the first end of the first round, early second round, an asset that they can really then probably turn into six or seven more picks, knowing Bill Belichick, you know, in the Jimmy Garoppolo style. So I, I would say that that's sort of what they're looking for at this point. What about Tooney? Tooney is a really tough one because he's tagged. So he only has, you know, once you trade for him at the deadline, you're only going to get him for eight games under contract and then you have to pay him. Right. So that, that in order to keep the player long term, if you're going to give up an asset, now you have to give him the bag. It's similar to like Amari Cooper in Dallas. So I think the, the problem is, is that to give up a high asset and then pay him the bag, that's not good business. Yeah, for most that's teams. not going to be good value on the trade. Or the especially Patriots aren't going to receive good value on the trade. Right, especially not for a guard. So I think the Patriots are going to look at it and say, okay, well, if we can't do better than the third-round comp pick that we're going to get from letting Joe Tooney walk in free agency, then let's just keep him the duration. And I think that that's probably where that's going to end yeah, up. That makes a lot of sense. So those are the two guys, Tooney and Gilmore. Yeah, and, and then also look at the quarterback. I mean, I don't think Cam's going to get traded, but what what happens if they lose this game in Buffalo? Do, at what point in time do you have to see what you have with Jared Stidham? It, just from a evaluation sure. standpoint, right? You Cowboys. Know, to see, is he the guy? Or the Cowboys, <laughs> maybe Chicago. You know, is he the guy, right? Or is, does he have the ability to be the yeah. guy? And, and I, you have to get that. And if you're a 2-5 and five football team, at some point when you know you're not going to make the playoffs, you have to get that answer. Yeah, because it does look like if things don't change for Cam, that is what the Patriots are going to have to look at. We, we, we've known that since the beginning of the season. This was always just a, you know, a, a shot in, in, in the dark. And, hey, do we get lucky? You know, does Cam resurrect his career here? Uh, could that still be the case? Sure. 
but if not, then it's about going back out there in the draft and seeing what's yeah. out there because they're, they're teams are just not giving away young quarterbacks. So, uh, and, and I don't see the jets trading Sam Darnold to the Patriots. So I don't even know if there's any other young quarterbacks that could get traded besides Sam Darnold in the off season. So you're looking at, I don't, and I don't even know if there are any other quarterbacks that are looking to move. Maybe the only other guy that's the obvious one is Aaron Rodgers. And, right. and exactly cool. what's going to happen so, with well, him. I said a long mutual admiration, mutual admiration society uh, with Aaron Rodgers. You know, uh, those two guys have gone back and forth and loved each other from the beginning. Belichick, two years ago, they played them in 2018, just went for like 10 minutes about gushing about how good Aaron Rodgers is. So it, I, I think that that's a little pie in the sky. I, He's got to go somewhere. I don't know where they turn from at quarterback if Cam is not going to be the long term or at least the short term, long term answer. Yeah, because I'm, once I'm you not... get past Trevor Lawrence, I'm telling you right now, once again, it's a crapshoot. You can say what you want about the kid from BYU and Ohio State. I love Justin Fields. But I those are Justin just regular Fields. first round quarterbacks that you just don't know what you're going to get. Yeah, and also, you know, the Patriots obviously have been in the position where they've had Brady, so they haven't had to use a high draft pick on a quarterback before but i don't see and, and granted he could do it and i could be totally wrong but i don't see bill belichick as the type of guy that gives up five future picks to go up and get a quarterback in the first round yeah. it just doesn't strike me as that type of, of gm or that type of uh you know the way that he constructs his team uh, i think he'd much rather take his jimmy garoppolo at the end of the second round or something like that and, and develop that guy similar to what they've done with stidham on on some levels too then go up there and make like a, a Deshaun Watson type trade or a Patrick Mahomes type trade, even though those two worked out beautifully for their sure. teams. I, I just don't know if that's Belichick's MO. All right. Well, look, it's all about Trevor Lawrence and no team, unless it, unless it's like the Bengals or the Chargers. Uh, and that's, I just don't see that happening. Those teams are not going to, I don't see them having a records worse than the jets. So, but those are the only teams that could possibly be okay. We're willing to trade the pick more than likely. Yeah. It's a Jacksonville, a Jets and so forth. That will no way you can, you can offer us 10 first round draft picks. We're not going to give it to you because they'd be stupid to give it yeah. to anybody. If you're going to get Lawrence. I also think there's a little bit of a, uh, in the league and, and just in league circles of like teams don't want to do the Patriots. That's true too. Favors. Yes. And they don't want to hand the Patriots the next yes. guy. So if you're a team that's picking up near the top of the draft, and I know this sounds a little bit crazy to not take the best deal on the table, I guarantee you it's going to be a factor of are we handing uh, you know, the next Tom Brady to the Patriots for another 20 years of success? We, we definitely don't want to yeah. do that or see that. So I think that there is a little bit of a struggle there in terms of acquiring quarterbacks. And part of the reason why they ended up with Cam Newton was because teams are not trying to do them or throw them any bones to try to fix this situation. Similar to the wide receiver position too. You know, Bill Belichick calls you right now and you're, let's say, Atlanta, the Atlanta Falcons. And they say, you know, we want to trade for Julio. And the Atlanta Falcons should be asking for three first yeah. round picks. These are the most desperate team in the league for yeah. Julio Jones. So, it, it kind of works in all the facets. All right, Evan. Uh, it'd be interesting. We'll see if the Patriots have a, 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 a you know the same roster that they have today. Uh, but we still yeah. have this. Is this will be the last game right before the deadline? Yeah. So the deadline is what uh, is uh, Election yes. Tuesday, November third. So uh, so they have one more game on Sunday against Buffalo, and then if they don't win that game against Buffalo, then don't be surprised at all if you start to see some fireworks out of New England. All right, Evan. Appreciate it. Enjoy the game. We'll talk to you again next week. Sounds good.